Um, thanks so much, Nick, and thank you, Lindsay and Carlos, and all of you uh, for being here. I'm sort of giddishly crawling out of my skin, really excited to have this conversation with Yuval and to be um, convening with all of you to talk about democracy reforms and how this intersects with uh, the right and the center right in American politics. Because um, I think we all, of course, want to make um, representative government functional. And uh, so I'd like to just start, Yuval, um, because you have been one of the really, you know, intellectual leading lights when it comes to reform. And you've been writing about reform on the right um, actually probably longer than there's been a democracy movement. I mean, it, I've been, you know, reading you between the reform of cons for, for some time. Um, most recently, and in the piece that Nick cited, make the 2020s a decade of reform. Uh, you talk about how we could reform, you know, our institutions of government, Congress, the executive branch, but also elections. Mm -hmm. And I think when conservatives, you know, knee jerk here reforms in the context of electoral reform in particular, um, too often, especially in the national narrative, the national media conversation, the national conversation, those ideas related to government reform seem to be generated by the left for the for the left's political advantage. Right. You, and, and, you know, we hear expanding the number of justices on the Supreme Court to abolishing the Electoral College to making D.C. and P, uh, Puerto Rico states. Right. So I think I think the first question and I'd like to sort of frame the conversation much the way Carlos did is, you know, what is not working? Why is reform necessary and why do conservatives need to be part of the reform? So first, take the first one. What's yeah. not working? Well, thank you, Margaret. That's a wonderful way to start the conversation. And I, I'm I'm very grateful to uh, be having the conversation with you and very grateful to unite us for bringing us together and for everything you're doing. Um, it is really enormously important to bring people to the table in these discussions, including people who don't think this is the table for them. And in a way, that's what we're getting at here. The question you ask, what's gone wrong? There are a lot of ways to think about that, but I would say one way to start is to see that um, the trouble we face now is not so much that the wrong sorts of ideas are being advanced in our politics, that the wrong side is winning on policy. It's that we aren't really having traditional policy conversations because our politics constantly breaks down at the level of what I would call political culture, where it becomes impossible for the parties to engage with one another um, as two sides of the question, how shall we resolve this problem? whatever the national challenge might be. And instead, we've got a politics of not even really two parties who are constantly at each other's throats, but two parties who have each withdrawn into its own space to talk about a caricature of the other. That's what our politics now looks like much of the time. And the, the challenge we face in getting out of this is that the people who are playing out this kind of politics they're not crazy and they're not stupid. They're responding to incentives, very powerful incentives that tell them this is the way to succeed in contemporary American politics. I think one way to focus on the problem is to focus on the core institution for resolving differences in our political system, which is the US Congress. The purpose of the Congress is, it's worth our thinking about because the Congress is not like a European parliament. It's not the kind of legislature where the majority party just runs everything until the, the public throws it out. The purpose of the Congress has always been to compel accommodation among people with differing views, to bring the different factions of American life to the table and have them talk to one another. And that is precisely what now is not happening in our politics. The two parties and the factions within the parties are able to basically ignore each other and speak instead to a select audience that they've chosen for themselves in a kind of echo chamber. Our institutions are not working to drive us to deal with one another, to see that the way to address problems is ultimately to bargain, to negotiate, to compromise. And we need to think about the incentives that can be changed in ways that might help our uh, public officials, elected officials see that that's the way forward. That dealing with one another is ultimately what the system asks of them and asks of all of us. And so I, I think that means for us that we have to think about how to change the structures of our institutions in order to change the incentives that confront the people within them. All that can happen within the constitutional system. This is not about changing the constitution. It's about changing the rules that were made for a reason 
at a time when they made sense, but that now don't serve us well. And we have to think about how they can be changed. And it is absolutely essential to see that this is not about left or right. As you say, there's often an assumption among fellow conservatives that these kinds of debates, democracy debates, debates about election systems, debates about institutional reform, are basically just ways to empower the left. There are ways to get more Democrats elected and ways to let Democrats get more done. Frankly, a lot of Democrats think that too, but they're mistaken. There are a lot of ways in which the kinds of reforms we talk about, reforms of the election system, of Congress and elsewhere, can help the right at least as much as the left, because they're basically intended to allow the system to better represent the differences that exist in our society and to better allow those differences to be worked out through engagement. And that is going to help a lot of conservatives get heard around the country in places where right now they're invisible. And it will let more of the fine grained diversity of our political system get heard in ways that allow us to actually make progress on the problems we face. That's why thinking about institutional reform, structural reform, electoral reform is absolutely essential right now. You cannot get to the problems of political culture without thinking in those terms. You know, by the way, I want to flag for everyone. Yuval and I will go back and forth for another five, 10 minutes, but get your questions going and send them to Lindsay, put them in the group chat. Um, because to Carlos's point, I mean, this is intended to be a networking community building event. Um, uh, it's, it's all of our questions. So please feel free to, to chat uh, Lindsay or throw your questions in the chat. But um, is there feedback? Are you guys hearing feedback? Thank you. I'm going to try it again. Um, Yuval, there are, you know, you talk about institutional reform in, in the context of Congress, um, but United America also focuses on electoral reform. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things you write in your piece uh, about the 2020s being the decade reform is that it, it only takes maybe one small modest reform in one small corner of the country to, uh, give sort of plausibility to to a new set of reforms. And there are a lot of ideas out there from ranked choice voting to nonpartisan primaries to vote by mail um, to uh, redistricting reform um, that, you know, one can beget the other. Uh, will the electoral reforms in and of themselves, it seems to me electoral reforms are, are part of the way of attacking the incentives in, in the congressional, in the problem that Congress presents yeah. with, the, in, with the incentive structures that are not aligned towards, you know, bargaining and accommodation, as you put it. What is your, what is your view? Yeah, I think that's problem? quite right. So if the problem, it's important to begin from the right definition of the problem. And I do think there are differences about that. If your view, like my view, is that the problem right now is that Congress is not enabling bargaining and accommodation, then what you're looking to do are not ways of empowering very narrow majorities to get their way and run over large, durable minorities. In other words, you're not trying to get rid of the filibuster. I think that's not the way to think about what's wrong with Congress. That's a way to turn Congress into a European legislature, which isn't really going to work in our system. The problem we're having is that Congress is not finding it possible to reach accommodations across party lines on major governing issues. So why is that? One important reason for that is that Congress has come to function more as an arena of expression, you might say, than an arena of contention. It's a place where members put on a show for TV cameras very often, rather than a place where they engage one another directly. And I think our election system is one important reason for that. A lot of members get elected in very safe partisan districts where their main worry is a primary challenge in their own party. And so their main audience in Congress is a small, devoted, often uh, partisan and dogmatic part of a uh, minority of their constituents back home. We don't have a lot of distinguished factions within our two parties that allow the parties to represent a kind of broad gauged uh, portion of the public. Each member is on his or her own, more or less, looking at his or her own district and thinking, how do I get through a primary? And so we need to think about ways to enable members both to build coalitions within their parties and across parties, and to enable members to think about the broader range of voters that they can speak to. The parties, as parties, want to build big tents, right? The Republican Party's got to get people elected in very different places. And so the party's incentive is 
is to reach is is to reach a broad constituency. But each member has a kind of deformed incentive in thinking about how to survive a primary. And part of the way to bridge this difference is to think about the election system. So I do think, for example, that experimenting with things like ranked choice voting that allow for a more fine grained representation to happen, for more factions to form within the party so that there's such a thing as a New England Republican as opposed to uh, a, 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 uh, a Louisiana Republican. And these are different, distinct points of view, but they are both within one party for a reason that's clear to voters. In that way, the differences within the parties can broaden the coalitions rather than narrowing their view. And electoral incentives are the most powerful incentives that members face. And so changing the way that, that elections work, which again can be done state by state, can be done by, by law, by the legislatures of the states, not by constitutional amendment, um, are ways to start thinking about how these different incentives can drive voters to want to speak to a broader constituency. I think it does have to be done by experimentation because we've got to see what the consequences are, what the implications are. You don't want to make a big mistake all at once. But it seems to me that by looking for more fine-grained representation, the sort of thing that ranked choice voting can help us achieve, um, you can begin to get to a place where members have an incentive to think about solving problems by reaching across differences. And that's ultimately what the national legislature is really for. So that's a way forward. Um, in addition to developing um, more diverse uh, conferences, like a more diverse Republican conference in the House of Representatives with more factionalized, as you suggest, which sort of harkens back to a um, as you said, the New England Republicans, a Rockefeller Republican, and, and Southern conservatives, although they were Democrats at the time, um, the sort of the '60s, right? The um, and, and earlier era in American politics. But but you have some pretty radical ideas about sort of reforming Congress. One is expanding the number of members of the House of Representatives. Uh, another is perhaps uh, multi-member House districts. How would either of those? Uh, reform Congress in a way that would fix the incentive structures in your view? Yeah, I, I think that, again, these are areas where it, it's important for us to think in terms of how to how we can change the rules so that the system works better for the country. And these rules are, are up for changing. Again, they're not written in the Constitution. These are things that were set up at a certain moment to achieve a certain goal and can be changed now. So that, for example, if we think about the size of the House, the House of Representatives grew almost every decade through the 19th century as the population grew. Originally, the House was set up in such a way that each member represented about 60,000 constituents. Today, each member represents almost a million constituents. Um, and in part, that's because the House stopped growing in 1911, and its current number was set by law. If you allow the, the House to grow a little bit, I wouldn't go back to 60,000 representatives. That would make a much too big legislature. But if you let the House grow by 50 to 100 members now, you'd achieve a couple of things. First of all, you would have more fine-grained representation. You'd have uh, members who have districts with fewer constituents and so are, are better able to represent them. Secondly, you would also rebalance the electoral college a little bit, again, without changing the constitution. Each state's electoral college uh, delegation is just the, its congressional delegation. So more house members means more members of the electoral college and you address some of the problems that some people have uh, on that front. But more importantly, you create a moment of reform in Congress, a kind of shot in the arm with a large number of new members entering the institution at the same time that would open up questions about the committee system, about the power of leadership, about the schedule, about the budget process. Why does Congress work this way? I think that's a question that a lot of members now need to ask themselves because the answer to it they're going to find isn't a very good answer. The answer is going to be, well, at some point, often in the 1970s, members of the House and Senate decided that this is how they wanted things to be for reasons of their own. And since then, members haven't thought in terms of how to change things for the better. I think that expanding the House would give the Congress a kind of shot in the arm that would create a moment of reform that would allow members to rethink a lot of things. The budget process that we have now is completely dysfunctional. It is, it is deformed beyond recognition, and it's time to rethink it. The distinction in Congress between appropriations and authorizations is really no longer makes much sense, especially in a Congress where earmarks are limited. All these kinds of questions have to be thought about again. And I'll tell you what I find, I spent a lot of time with members of Congress, 
And I find that a lot of them are very unhappy with how the institution works. But when you tell them, well, you could just change it. You could change the budget process on your own. That's just up to the House or the Senate. That's news to a lot of members. And I think we've got to get to a place where that's the assumption they have is we can make this system work so that Congress does its job. And getting there would require a, a kind of shot in the arm, some set of reforms that would get members thinking in terms of changing the institution. I, okay, I invite all of your questions. Please send them in. But to that point, of all, look, if 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 Congress if Congress is sick, right? If if the body's um, incentive structures are off, if um, members of Congress themselves, let's pretend they all know they can fix it. If the incentive structures are off and the body itself is is um, is incapable of uh, addressing these issues, like what gives you this this yeah. faith? or the sense that it is capable of fixing its own ailments. Well, uh, you know, ironically, my my hope comes from the fact that people recognize that things are in terrible shape. It's because I very rarely run across a member of Congress who says, this place is great. Things are going just right. Instead, what you hear is, this needs to change. And that, to me, suggests a readiness to an openness to reform ideas that could actually help the institution function better. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's gonna have the same idea of what that looks like. I don't think they would. I think there would need to be debates about the purpose of these reforms and therefore the shapes of these reforms. But the idea that members could be open to the possibility that this institution is up to them to shape and that state legislatures could be open to considering changes in our election laws too. That, to me, is rooted in the basic sense that Americans know something needs to change in this moment, that Americans know that this is not the way our politics ought to be working. And so it's incumbent upon people whose work is to think about structural reform like this to approach people in that mode and say, yes, things need to change, and here's how, a way to think about how they could work better. 